everybody, welcome back to the Clinical Trials Guru.com. I hope you've all had a really happy new year. It's now January 4th, 2016. Um, not my first video in 2016, though. On, I believe it was January 2nd, I did a video, which, by the way, is very telling and very much uh, indicative of what I think is starting to happen, especially in 2016 and going forward. Uh, where this year is kind of like everyone's expecting this year to kind of be Snapchat's breakout year and with all the users they're generating um, and adding every day and as that demographic is now getting older, it used to be just teenagers and early 20-somethings, now it's mid-20s, late 20s, 30s. I know people who are in their 50s and 60s using Snapchat. So just like we saw Facebook uh, demographics increasing in age, uh, as the years went on. So when Facebook came out in 04, it was just college kids. Now, 2016, um, and I think from 2013 until 2016, the highest, the fastest growing demographic on Facebook were people over 55. So I think we're starting to see that happen in Snapchat. And that was the first ever, the first time I ever created a video on Snapchat first, where I answered a bunch of Snapchat users questions on how to become CRAs and uh, then I created a YouTube video out of it by using the actual Snapchat footage so this is a huge call to action uh, if it's not obvious already to go follow me on Snapchat my username is Dan Svera just like my YouTube username find me there uh, most of my attention is there so that's a quick way to hack it um, I've been getting a lot of emails I try to get back to all you guys Dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. Also, you can call or text me anytime, 949-415-6256. I try as hard as humanly possible to get back to all of you guys through those methods. But right now, most of my attention is on Snapchat. And so those people who are asking me questions on Snapchat actually get answered. Uh, usually, that's the way it works. I don't plan it that way. It's just the way it happens. They get more attention, much more attention from me. So if that's important for you, go ahead and add me there. If not, you can just call or text or email me. I'll eventually get around to it, uh, usually within a few days or so. All right, so uh, yeah, just a little side note. I think this year is going to be huge for Snapchat, and I think more and more people are going to start using it. Snapchat's maturing. Um, yeah, so with that being said, this is going to be one of the uh, longer videos. One of my, I think I'm going to go like 20 minutes or so. So... I'm answering a bunch of questions that I've kind of, uh, I guess, batched, and I have a lot of other questions, so I've got a lot of content material for the next couple of weeks, which is good. You guys have been sending in the questions through email, through Snapchat, through Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. A lot of you guys use LinkedIn, so I'm going to be creating video uh, every day this week. This is the first working week of 2016. And I have plenty of content, um, plenty of videos to produce. I thank you guys for keeping me busy. So today, there's a few questions uh, that I'm going to get to. And then we're going to basically create more videos tomorrow and later on this week, right? So let's get right into it. I, again, I wish you guys all a very happy start of 2016. I hope you guys are really successful this year. Make it your best year ever, okay? Uh... Okay, clinical operations. So this first question is all about clinical operations. What would you say are the major functions within a clinical research site? Example, finance, business development, regulatory, marketing, human resources, operations. So the major functions within a clinical research site, let's start with the very simple, small research clinics, okay? Uh, you need a PI, you need a study coordinator, and that's really about it. I mean, you can count having the patients, um, but then you can either have a recruiter or have the PI and the coordinator do the recruiting, which is the simplest yet most effective way, especially for the smaller clinics. So those are the most important components of any clinical research trial. Of course, you can break down all the separate functions. So you've got regulatory, Okay, people who just do the regulatory stuff like startup regulatory, um, ongoing regulatory maintenance. I know some big sites that have individuals that do nothing but startup regulatory and maintenance of all, all regulatory 
uh, documents for all studies at that site so that the coordinators don't have to do that, which is good for those coordinators because regulatory can become quite tedious and, as we all know, or maybe we don't know, does not generate any revenue. Okay, You're not getting paid for doing regulatory maintenance on your regulatory documents. It just doesn't work that way. You get paid from the visits that you conduct at your site for each protocol. So the idea behind outsourcing that, or not outsourcing that, but delegating the regulatory function to one person who does nothing but regulatory is a great idea. I've tried it out at one of my sites once, a small site. We had about seven employees at the time, not counting our PIs. Uh, and I was that regulatory person. Uh, but I had a little spin on it. I was the startup regulatory person, and then the coordinators would maintain the reg binders. Uh, but if we would have had mm, probably twice as many studies or maybe three times as many studies, I would have hired a person to do just regulatory from start to finish, meaning from site selection visit, study startup, study maintenance, and study closeout, and even the archiving stuff. All right, so you got regulatory. More, more importantly than that, um, or I shouldn't say more importantly because these are all important functions in a clinical research site, but very important and very near and dear to my heart is uh, business development. Okay, so you're not going to have anything to do at your research clinic. You're not going to have a business if you don't have studies. So somebody at your site, usually in the early stages, it's the owner because there's no one else to do it, and I would not delegate this as I feel it is absolutely the most important task um, that you can do, especially at a brand new site, but for any site in any level of its uh, stages of existence. Business development should not be ignored. In any industry, sales is the lifeblood of that organization. Sales can cure all problems within the sites, or I, I, I should say, sales can cure most of the problems in any business. Um, I've never heard of a clinic or any business going out of business because they were doing too good at sales. Just not the case, right? Sales is super important. Uh, business development is extremely important in a research clinic. Uh, sites go out of business all the time for not having studies and then having to lay off a bunch of their staff and then eventually there's no reason to keep the site open without studies. So that's why I have a consulting firm. We, do, we help sites all the time from startup research sites to established large research companies uh, and CROs uh, do their business development. So a lot of people outsource that task to us. I have a whole team of people working at these standing desks at this office where I'm at and where I'm going to talk about later because it relates to another question I got. And across multiple different sites I have, we have an infrastructure of people doing nothing but business development tasks all day long. They send 100 emails a day. They make follow-up phone calls. They uh, complete our feasibility surveys. They get the CDAs processed for the sites. If you need help with that, call or text me, 949-415-656. We'll set up a plan that's right for your site. Okay, so business development, you've got regulatory, you've got the coordinators, you've got the PI. That would fall under the operations. So in most big companies, you'll have like a CEO, a CFO, which is chief financial officer, and then a COO. So another task in a research clinic is finance, right? And again, a lot of these tasks are usually and often done by the same person. So I'm a perfect example. When I started my clinic, South Coast Clinical Trials, which has now spun off into something else, uh, which I'm not a part of anymore, but I've had that site for about 10 years. Uh, was it 10 years? It was from 2005 until 2012. So no, no, it was like seven or eight years. Uh, when we started out, I was the coordinator, I was the patient recruiter, I was the regulatory person, I was the finance, contract and budget person, uh, I was the janitor, I was the maintenance man, everything. Okay, uh, I picked up the phones, I was the receptionist. You can't hire, or I, I guess you can if you have a budget to do it, if you're financed, but most of you guys are not going to be. You don't have the money to hire people to do all those tasks. It's going to have to be you, 
and you're going to have a lot of things that you're going to have to do early on that you're not necessarily good at doing, that you don't necessarily want to do, that you don't like doing. Tough. You know, you want to be in business, you've got to do things you don't like to do. You can get to the point where you can delegate these things, and you should, which is where I'm at now. I've actually been there um, at each clinic that I operate. It's a little different. But the goal should be the things that you're not good at doing should eventually be delegated to someone who's more suitable at doing those things than you are. And then you're getting a return on your investment. Not only that, the opportunity cost of you doing work that doesn't produce value, such as regulatory maintenance, um, the opportunity cost there is that when you're doing that kind of stuff, you can't enroll patients, you can't screen patients, you can't randomize patients. So you want to get those things uh, delegated as quickly as possible. But it's my business philosophy that you should not delegate any task until you learn the process, right? And whether you hate it, whether you like it, whether you're good at it, you're going to figure all those things out because you're not going to know initially whether you're good at something or whether you hate something until you actually start doing it. Uh, but you've got to learn the process so that you can write the manuals and you can kind of develop internal processes for, uh, for these functions, okay, for contracts and budgets, for regulatory. Um, as far as like, you know, you want to get down to the nitty gritty details of each function and you're not going to know what those are unless you do it yourself. So I've never delegated anything to anyone until I learn how to do it, all right? And on top of that, to take it one step further, you should write, as you're learning those functions, you should be writing SOPs um, or something similar to an SOP. If you're not going to share it with the sponsors, that's fine. You can have an SOP that you share with sponsors, and then you can have an SOP for just internal purposes and call it something else, like a manual. So if you want to uh, teach the process of regulatory to someone you're going to delegate it to, you have the process written down, down to every single detail, and it's a work in progress. So as you learn something new or as regulatory changes occur, uh, let's say sponsors start requesting new requirements that they did not request in the past, you've got to update those SOPs. And then you've got to train your staff or retrain your staff who you've delegated on doing those things. So what functions did I talk about? Finance, regulatory, um, contracts and budgets, operations, okay, so the operations is the whole other side of this thing where it's the PI, the sub-I, the coordinators, the data entry people, um, we can have recruiters which could be a separate department, so you could get extremely complex with this or you can, like I said, wear many hats initially um, and still understand the process of each of these different tasks and functions within a research clinic. So operations, I mean, PI, sub I, coordinator, data entry, that's another department right there. Each of those, by the way, should have a separate um, process, like PI should have their own trainings, study coordinator should have trainings, uh, data entry people should have a process for how to, how to enter data, what's the process, uh, learning about electronic signatures, all those kind of things. Uh, recruitment, that's a whole other function, which again, a coordinator can do, a PI can do, or you can hire someone who just recruits. I've done that in the past too. Uh, once I got sick of just recruiting because I didn't have time to go out in the community and recruit patients, when I had a waiting room full of patients that I needed to screen and randomize at the clinic. So I learned the process of recruiting and then I hired a recruiter who was actually really good, in fact better than I was, and paid him. Paid him uh, pretty good money to recruit and we did really well. So those are the functions that I see. Then you have the archiving, which is kind of like regulatory too, because you gotta maintain the records for X amount of years after a study's closed out. So I guess you can have an archiving department. And then you can go even further and have a human resources department. And again, most of my clinics were extremely small, meaning under 10 employees. In fact, that's been my business philosophy from day one rather than having one big mega site somewhere, have like a bunch, like a hundred, uh, I'm not at a hundred yet, I'm at a couple dozen, hundred small sites where we have 10 employees or less and we're doing anywhere from seven to 30 studies a year. 
right? And those could be really profitable sites as well. And it's just whatever philosophy you prefer. Um, I just prefer doing it that way because I like to diversify. I don't like to rely on one stream of income and having one major site, while it may be really good for overhead uh, and profit, uh, you're also dependent on just one company. I like to have multiple, but there's all kinds of ways you can do this. Um, so again, where I'm going with this is at my small clinics, uh, there's no need to have an HR person. I did outsource the payroll to, first I used ADP, and now, we're using Paychex at one of my sites. Um, at another one of my sites where we have just two employees, uh, we use Wells Fargo because that's who we bank with and they provide payroll services at a discount for us and it just keeps things a lot simpler. Uh, so as far as that kind of HR stuff, I delegated, but as far as the HR of hiring, firing, training, uh, counseling when needed, um, I'm actually really interested in HR. Uh, I believe it's part science, part art. Uh, I like interacting with people, so I prefer to run my own HR department. And uh, I have business philosophy of helping my employees, even if it means they're going to end up competing with me. Um, that's fine, because as I build that kind of a reputation, I'm going to attract good talent. And oftentimes, like I was talking about creating all those small sites, these employees actually don't end up competing with me. They end up wanting to partner with me on other sites of their own where they're going to have a majority stake equity in their site and all come on as a either a silent partner or a minority shareholder. So it's, it's paid off for me, um, but I've always felt that helping your employees out even if it's not necessarily in your best interest, is ultimately what's best for the company. And uh, Gary Vaynerchuk, somebody I follow on YouTube, for those of you who don't know who he is, just Google his name. Um, he's got this interesting philosophy that I've adopted. It's called the 5149 principle. I don't know if it's called the principle, but he basically says, hey, I will give my employees or the people that work for me 1% more value in their relationship than they're giving me. So I'm okay giving them 51 as long as I get 49 from them. And I kind of, I do like that philosophy a lot. I've kind of been doing that all along even before I heard about it. He put it in a way that really illustrated the essence of that concept. And so helping your employees, um, even if it means that it's not necessarily helping you in the long run um, is always going to be my philosophy because I do think it does help you actually in the long run. And it may not help you in the long run all the time, but your employees are going to be uh, willing to go the extra mile while they're working for you knowing that you've got their best interest in mind. So I apologize for going off on a tangent there. Uh, let's get to this next question, because this video is going to go on forever. Budgetary questions. So before entering into negotiations with a sponsor, what would you say are the most important things you need to do to prepare, and how would you go about preparing yourself? What information do you need to know to make an informed decision? You need to know the protocol. You need to know it really well. You need to ask your PI whether they can get the patients. You need to ask your PI what every single assessment is that you don't know what it is because chances are you're not a doctor or you're not a clinician and uh, your PI might know what those those procedures are. Your PI is going to have an idea of whether, first of all, whether he or she can do those assessments or whether you'll need to outsource those to a sub I because that's going to add cost uh, and they're going to be able to tell you how much time it takes. So having a really detailed understanding of the protocol is a must before you ever negotiate any budget uh, some other things to have that come in handy are your overhead policy. Ask for 40% if you don't have an overhead policy. Email me, dan at theclinicaltrialsguru.com. I will email you the wording that I use. You can make it apply for your site. You don't need to go word for word, but just so you get an idea of what an overhead policy should look like. I always ask for 40%. Doesn't mean you're always going to get 40%. Sometimes you do. 
I've known many people who I've shared this policy with that have gotten 40%, and I know many who have not. It's random, right? But it's better to have something than not to have it because you may not get 40, but you might get 30, and the original budget was 20%. So having a written policy in place is always helpful. And that's the, those are the two things I would have, um, the overhead policy and then a very detailed understanding and a deep understanding of the particular protocol that you're negotiating. All right? Uh, next question. Marketing. One of my favorites. Oh, no, here's another one. Do CROs get paid quarterly? Some CROs say that they can only pay the site quarterly because they get paid quarterly. Is this just smoke? Uh, yes and no. Sometimes they do just get paid quarterly. Sometimes they get paid yearly. Um, but it's everything is negotiable, okay? The, it's the CRO's job to make sure that the sites are enrolling patients and keeping good data and adhering to GCP. They can negotiate whatever they want with a sponsor that has nothing to do with what they're going to pay you, all right? They can pay you monthly. They have they have money to pay monthly. Um, sometimes they will refuse and they will pay quarterly. Um, I don't accept quarterly payments. I accept monthly payments only because monthly payments end up becoming quarterly payments anyways. Uh, as is often the case in most studies because a lot of things have to go right for you to get a payment such as monitors have to review the data. Every study has different payment triggers. I still have yet to figure out exactly how they do it because every study is different. Every company in CRO has a different process. It seems like for every different protocol even if it's the same CRO. So yes, they're not just blowing smoke um, but it doesn't mean you can't negotiate. Okay. And it's your job, it's in your best interest and your job to negotiate what's best for your site. And if you think quarterly is not going to be good for your site, you shouldn't take the study. All right, marketing. What are the top three ways to increase brand awareness? Can you recommend a clinical site that has a good website design? So let's go with the brand awareness. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are going to think I'm going to talk about it online stuff and I'm actually not I'm gonna talk about offline stuff so the number one way to get brand awareness is in your own community in your neighborhood in your city where your site is located you need to be a presence if you're doing uh, Alzheimer's studies guess what you should be attending as many Alzheimer's Association functions in your city as possible you need to be going at all the Alzheimer's walks all the events they have uh, you need to be going to senior centers. You need to make your brand known locally, offline. All right? And then there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do online, which everyone should do because it's close to free as possible. I mean, there's some costs like getting a website design, which I'm going to talk about next. And, uh, but other than that, I mean, social media is free. It just takes time. And... Uh, I handle most of our social media stuff uh, for most of our sites except for a couple where we have other people running the social media campaigns. Uh, we do mostly free social media stuff, but we also do some paid ads like Facebook ads are good, Google AdWords are good, so if you have any kind of budget for that, that would be good. Um, networking with physicians in your area who can refer patients, again going back to offline. That's another way of going of, of going about uh, building up a brand awareness for your company. So yeah, going out in the community with all the different patient advocacy groups and nonprofit organizations for whatever disease or medical conditions you guys are treating, networking with physicians in your city, and having a web presence, whether that be running Facebook ads, running Google ads, uh, running having a Facebook page, having a website, which is your next question. I don't know why I put my phone away because I got a bunch of other questions. Uh, your next question is, can you recommend a clinical site that has a good website design? Uh, I'm not going to really recommend any. I mean, these days, it's, it's 2016. Most websites are pretty good, and it's relatively cheap to have a good website. I don't think it's that important necessarily to have a good website. I think it's important to have one. I think I definitely would not pay 
five or ten grand for anybody to design your website. Um, you can put something together yourself that's going to be decent. These days you can use WordPress or you can use uh, what's that, Squarespace to create a nice looking website for free and they're pretty easy to figure out how to do. If you're not savvy at that kind of stuff, I guarantee you somebody at your site is and they can do it. So website design's overrated. I mean, everyone's got a website. It's kind of what you do. What is your strategy for attracting people to your website or to a landing page? Um, first of all, are you gonna be attracting CROs to learn more about your site? Are you gonna be attracting patients? Uh, to learn more about the studies you have, those are going to be different strategies and different tactics. And I think actually having landing pages where you can create an ad campaign targeted at a group like patients and then having them go to a landing page is much more important than having just a website, a static website that doesn't change. Uh, blogging, I mean, I think it's important. If, if that's not obvious by now, nothing's going to convince you. You should have some kind of a blog. Uh, somebody should be creating some kind of content. Why? Because it's free, basically. It just takes time. And again, who are you trying to target? Are you trying to target patients? Go ahead and do that. Uh, here's, here's a free business idea to anybody who's willing to try. I haven't done this um, because I just don't have time. I've got like so many projects going on. I don't have time. But a lot of research clinics are blogging and are creating content on their websites or on their blogs for patients, which is good. I think we all should do that. Nobody that I know of is creating content for CROs or sponsors or the, the decision makers at those CROs and sponsors because guess what? They're human beings. They go on Google. They look up information related to their line of work. No research site that I know of and if anyone out there knows of, of anyone doing this, let me know. No research clinic that I know of is creating content for CROs and sponsors. What kind of topics they're looking for. Um, they're interested in, obviously, patient recruitment. They're interested in sites adhering to GCP. They're interested in PI training. They're interested in uh, how to complete a study quicker. Uh, research what they're interested in, figure out what they're interested in, create content targeted at them, post it on LinkedIn because everyone's on LinkedIn, um, run a Google ad for it, run a Facebook ad targeting sponsors. All right? I mean, there's so many things you can do. I haven't had time to do this. I don't know if I'm going to get around to it in 2016 because I've got a lot of goals for this year. So um, it's just another business development strategy that I think would work and that no one's been doing. <clears throat> Personal question. Are you actively managing a clinical research site? Not the sites you have equity in. Like I said, there's a couple dozen that I have equity in but don't actively manage. Uh, are you actively managing a clinical research site? Uh, the closest one I have to where I'm actively managing is my brand new clinic, well not brand new, we started it in August 2013, Global Clinical Trials in Irvine. I'm in one of their office spaces now. Um, I don't go there every day, I go Mondays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and sometimes Fridays. Uh, but that would be the site that I'm most actively involved in, just because I live really close to the site and I kind of use it as my home base. <clears throat> now. I have equity and I own and I help in different ways. Um, a lot of those tasks we mentioned earlier, specifically business development and marketing and a little bit of recruitment when need be or recruiting PIs, recruiting patients, things like that. Um, I have a lot of those different kind of tasks with different sites across the country that I own equity in. Uh, in addition to that, I also consult for a lot of sites in which I have absolutely no equity in, but they pay me a monthly fee for consulting for them. So the only one I'm actively managing is Global Clinical Trials. Don't look at our website. It needs serious uh, work. Uh, but again, it's consistent with my philosophy that having a website is not really that important as long as you have one and it looks decent. But we definitely need to invest a little bit more time in that website. That's globalclinicaltrials.org. And by the way, I, create, I created that website for free. So 
we're going to be fixing that website up, but yeah, uh, that's the closest site I have to where I'm actively managing it, uh, meaning I am in charge of hiring, firing, training employees, uh, and all that other stuff. Uh, but I don't do any coordinating anymore. Uh, here, this person says again, I believe you said once you sold South Coast Clinical Trials, if you care to share why. So what we did with South Coast Clinical Trials, I started it, uh, actually my dad started it with a group of people uh, back in 2004, that's when I graduated college. Uh, they actually hired me as a study coordinator. My goal at that time was just to get one year of experience as a study coordinator and then apply to Quintiles to be a CRA. Um, three months into that, three months into my being hired there, right out of college, uh, three of my dad's business partners got sick of the business. They weren't making money. They abandoned it. My dad was ready to close it. He gave me the opportunity to take over if I wanted to, which means pay the bills, uh, <clears throat> meaning rent, utilities, all that stuff, uh, patient stipends, because we had a couple studies going on. I thought about it for a day, and I decided, yes, I will do it. Um, I didn't really have much to lose at that time. Uh, again, I was young. The younger you are, the more risks you should take. I knew all that stuff, so I did it, and I was the sole owner from 2005 until, no, from 2006 until 2010, and then I brought on some investors. So remember at the very beginning of this video, I was talking about delegating stuff. So between 2006 and 2010, I was trying to delegate as many of those tasks and functions that we talked about to other people. Oftentimes I would hire people to do those tasks, but sometimes I met people or I knew people who wanted to be involved as investors, and so their strengths complemented my weaknesses. So I brought in three other um, equity partners, one at a time, and uh, I guess we started to not get along very well. Um, and we were making money too. We were making really good money, and... Um, we had our differences, uh, so I won't get into details, but you got to be very careful and very selective about who you become business partners with, because it really is like a marriage. So what we do, what we did, because we were making really good money, is we agreed to spin it off, um, and we had different South Coast Clinical Trials at that time had different clinics, so we decided to and agreed to spin off each clinic, so each owner got one of the clinics and uh, we went our separate ways. I still am involved, not business wise, but I still talk to those former partners today and uh, it's a lot easier and uh, we have a lot more um, pleasant conversations these days not working together um, as, as we did before in the past uh, or as opposed to what we did in the past which was usually not get along very well, right? Kind of like Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal, right? You don't have to like each other to work together and be successful, but ultimately you do have to go your separate ways. That's what happened there. Um, but yeah, we were making really good money, especially when we started getting those inpatient studies going. And again, we were a small site, so overhead was really low and very profitable. Uh, if you care to share why, so I just did, uh, focusing on consulting real estate or needed a change, all of the above, and um, I mean, I'm interested in other industries as well. Uh, many of you know or may not know, I'm also a realtor. Uh, I got my license in 2012, right around that time, actually. Actually, it was 2013 when I got my real estate license. Um, so I think real estate is my real long-term game, meaning I've been a real estate investor since my company started getting profitable back in 06, and the more real estate deals I did, the more I met realtors who were doing well and it seemed like something I would like to do. So I got my license and I started focusing on that too. And as a realtor, I have about one client a month. So I have about one transaction a month. It takes me a couple hours a month to actually uh, handle that work. So um, it doesn't take away too much of my clinical research time. Plus I've been able to delegate a lot of my tasks at different sites and diversify. Um, and do a lot of consulting now. This year, we're enrolling our first students into our CRA Academy, so we're training people 
with zero experience on how to become CRAs and then we actually make sure that they land an interview with a CRO and get hired uh, to be CRAs. So doing that, working on a patient recruitment website which I believe should be ready in the next couple of weeks. So a lot of stuff going on and uh, yeah, it was just time for me to diversify at, in 2012 and yeah, that was my strategy and that we all agreed that that was the right way to go about it. They're doing well. Um, the other partner's doing well as well. Uh, they both have small sites now. I'm doing well. We have a lot of stuff going on. So yeah, that's all my time for today. I want to thank you guys very much for watching. Um, stay tuned for tomorrow and again add me on snapchat because I'm going to be doing matter of fact I got another question here and the only way to get more users on snapchat is to entice you guys to add me there so I'm going to read you the question that I got and I'm going to answer it on snapchat sorry but if you want to hear the answer you got to add me on snapchat Dan Sparrow I have five years of experience uh, as a clinical research coordinator and have a PI in general medicine I could work with. I am looking to get a loan to start my own clinic. My question is, how do I apply for clinical trials to get a site qualification visits? I have no idea how to apply to get a study for a, a clinical trial site. I know clinicaltrials.gov and there is contact info for all studies. Should I submit an email and ask if I can participate in a study? How do I go about that? I will um, learn about contracts and again all that stuff we talked about afterwards. I am very interested in going into business for myself. I have the labor part down. I just need to know how to get a study, negotiate a budget and deal with that side of clinical trust. So I will answer this question on Snapchat only. So you got to add me there. All right. Dan from the clinical trials guru.com. Take care.